Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Six Degrees of Associations. I feel like I'm starting off every episode these days saying this is one that's been in the making for a bit, but it is. We got recommended to talk to Joe Waters of Selfish Giving back in when we were speaking with Amanda Kiefer, if you remember oh. that, um, Lucas. And we're so excited to finally get you on, on the show today, Joe. So thank you and welcome for being here. Yeah, thanks for being here. And thanks for Amanda to the recommendation. Absolutely. She spoke volumes of you. So we can't wait to unpack everything that you've got to say. And I have to say your accent's my favorite accent in the world. So I can't wait to sit back and listen. I'm going to try to no, do no, my no, listening no, ears no, always. Let's get Julie talking. More of that accent. Yeah, that, I know, right? You know, Bring it you know, out. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people say things about Boston accents, but they say nationally after a Southern coastal accent, yeah. the Boston accent is the most desirable accent. It's so I was kind of surprised by that, but you can't, you can't fight the numbers on this, right? Yeah, you it's can't. Right. Yeah, good is I love an it. accurate description. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, my family hails from Providence, Rhode Island. So it's like a le- even a little hey, stronger yeah. in there. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love that accent. So I grew up with it. And welcome, Lucas. Good to see you. Thank you, Aaron. Again, we've been talking about this outside of the pod for a while. Amanda got our gears churning about cause marketing, and, and uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. So, Joe, maybe you could just um, start the show off by telling us a little bit about yourself and Selfish Giving. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a, a big background in the nonprofit world. I've spent uh, about 30 years either working for or with nonprofits. You know, I've worked with companies, organizations, I should say, like um, the Arthritis Foundation, Muscular Dystrophy Association, actually begin with the Jerry Lewis Telethon. I worked uh, for PBS. I worked at uh, Boston Medical Center, which is the largest safety net hospital in New England. And uh, I started their cause marketing and their social media program. And I've actually worked for an association too. I worked several years for the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, which I really enjoyed and felt like that was very applicable to my nonprofit work. Um, about the time that I was working at BMC, uh, we were, you know, talking about a way that we could communicate with the companies that we were working with about the things we were doing at the hospital. And we came up with a little blog. It's called Selfish Giving. Uh, I've been writing it now. It seems a long time. It's like 2004, 2005. I think it was December 2004 that I actually launched it. Um, but since then, I've published you know, hundreds of posts on my site. And in 2010, I started my own business after writing Cost Marketing for Dummies. And then I wrote another book on fundraising with businesses for Wiley. And I've been acting in the space now for over a decade, teaching nonprofits and businesses how to work together and raise money and change the world. That's really, really cool. I've been doing some, some research and digging in and learning more about your stuff, Joe. Uh, I'm blown away. <laughs> you know, the selfish giving piece. Yeah, uh, that's a really cool brand. And actually, I was listening to one of your speech where you were talking about brand and how you lead with brand. And so you know, we were chatting before. I'd love to hear a little bit about how our association partners can sort of get into more involved with cause marketing, but sort of through the lens, if you will, of or leading with brand. Yeah, no, and and let's face it too, your brand is so important. As a matter of fact, I like to tell people brands command, right? Like, especially in the nonprofit world, if you want to do more cause marketing, when we look at the brands that really excel in cause marketing, who are they? They're product red, they're American Cancer Society, St. Jude's, of course, Make-A-Wish. These organizations have great brands. But, you know, a lot of times it comes to like, what is a brand, right? You know, Jeff Bezos has said that your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room, right? Uh, But I believe because of technology and mobile media and social media, I really believe that your brand is what people are saying about you online. That's why it's so important that you build a strong, engaged audience online. And with that, what we find is that companies come calling because companies, what I argue, Lucas and Aaron, is that companies look for audiences to tell them what is good, popular, and profitable in this world. And if your organization has a strong audience, an engaged audience, and either a large audience or a niche audience, or both, you can be very successful with cause marketing and raising money from companies in general, because that's the thing that companies are looking for more than anything else. Yeah, we we work with a lot of associations, uh, and I've worked with thousands in the past who have really great engaged membership. They do an awesome job about getting their members and expressing value. And I'd be curious what your thoughts are on some tactical ways that they could start to you know sort of pick and choose, right? Because the ones at a national level 
who do it really well are going to have people calling them. How yes. do you choose that right partner? How do you, you know, what type of advice would you give them for guiding them through that first, that first step? Well, you know, it's really, you know, it's really something to think about, right? Because, you know, it, you know, it, years ago, it's funny, it's funny, Lucas and everyone, because years ago, I would actually give nonprofits advice and say, hey, you know, take a chance, you know, work with this company, see what happens, you know, there's a great opportunity. But there's such sensitivity out there right now to brand partnerships that we really have to make sure that our brands align with the organizations that we're working with, right? And we have to think sometimes like, you know, is this appropriate? You you know, because we see things, you know, like, you know, big events like the Iditarod, right, in Alaska, where people are looking at an event like that and they're saying, hey, you know, uh, based on climate change, a lot of, uh, you know, oil sponsors, gas sponsors of that event, you know, there's questionable activities happening during the Iditarod in Alaska, you know, should we be involved in that as a brand? And then the organization, a nonprofit organization which runs that event, has to think about, you know, do we want to be associated with these people or do we want to be associated with others? So it's very important that you are clear on what your values are and what types of organizations you will work with. And, you know, that's why the first place it should begin in working with companies, it should start with your own brand in terms of thinking about what you represent and outlining it on paper about what that means. I love that. I'm curious if you've, um, and I know this because I used to work in the automotive industry. And I remember when we kept looking at you know, nonprofit opportunities. And it was all, you know, climate change was the big thing. And I'm going, guys, I'm not sure how we can be in this conversation authentically yeah, right yeah. now, you know, so let's not just hop onto the trend of what's yeah, everyone's yeah. giving to let's figure out what's appropriate. I'm curious, do you have an example of where, um, you know, a an unusual company decided on an unusual, maybe not top headline, you know, forward nonprofit to partner with from a cause marketing perspective that ultimately really tied authentically to their brand? Yeah, well, I could definitely think of some bad examples of that, right? Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, because those are the ones that really kind of stand out, right? But, sure. you know, we can go all the way back to KFC and uh, Susan Coleman, right? Yeah. You know, this is back in uh, 2012, 2013, when um, Susan Coleman partnered with KFC for Buckets for the Cure. So the yeah. idea with this program is it was going to be the most successful cause marketing program ever. The goal was to raise $8 million. And the truth was, is that consumers got to the counter and they said, I don't know whether a breast cancer organization, a health organization should be working with a fast food chain in this way. Right. And, right. you know, so it got really complicated. And a lot of people have pointed to that as the beginning of the slide for Susan Coleman in terms of them as an organization and, and getting mm -hmm. partnerships and stuff. So, you know, we really just need to be careful about the people that we work with. And I think you said it best, Aaron, authenticity, right? That is mm -hmm. so critical in terms of if you're going to work with something, you know, because a lot of people, and one of the things we were brainstorming, even about the Buckets for Cure program is think about ways that that may have been improved. Maybe it would have been right. only with the skinless, you know, the skinless right. chicken, you know what I mean? Right. Or, or maybe it Brilliant. included a salad. Yeah. yeah, that's right. You know, throw us, throw us, so throw a salad right. in there. You know, I mean, there are ways to do this. And what we see in a lot of instances is fast food chains work with a lot of causes, but they don't work with a lot of health causes, right? right. And, you mm -hmm. know, the, the master of this is, of course, is Ronald McDonald House, right? Because mm -hmm. McDonald's has a relationship, but they're one step removed from actual health you know, illnesses, which makes right. it, you know, makes it explains, you know, where their brain should be. Right. Yeah. yeah. A good, good example of the, of the yeah. synergy and also maybe the divide. Yeah. Uh, right. I, yeah. I also hear a lot, you know, everybody wants to leverage social and be the next ice bucket challenge type of deal uh, with yeah. regard to raising money for causes. But you, you actually are a big fan of the, the fact that the email is not dead. Yeah. And that, that, you know, there's still a lot of traction to be done there. And, yeah. and with some cases, we would call it more traditional, you know, marketing yeah. communication tool. Like, you know, what, what are your thoughts there around how can we use email? Yeah, well, you know, it, what I teach my nonprofit clients is email plus one. So you can choose. So what I often argue with people is they should have a keystone content asset. And that what, what that means is a place where they're building their digital audience. The best place to do that is email. But a lot of people want to add a social media site, but, you know, a Facebook page or a podcast, or uh, they want to add TikTok or what have you. So what I always emphasize with people is that whatever you use, it should come back to email. Because something that's important in the 
nonprofit world, Lucas and Everton, and probably in the associate, association world too, is um, social media is great for awareness, but it's not always great for asking for money. So what we often find is people get to know you through social media, but when it comes to actually making a donation, a lot of times they're doing that through email. And the best thing about email too is you own your list, right? You're not the victim of algorithm changes or outages or you know uh, changes in, in terms of agreement and stuff like that. So it's so important that you stick to email as one of the most central features of where you're building your audience because you own that audience. And over time, yeah. after you build trust and value with that audience, you can ask them for money. Yeah, it's, it's captive and it's defined. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, the, you know, the good thing is, is you can still, you know, the, and I've talked to a number of people. I actually just talked to an organization the other day uh, that was on Instagram and they have built a huge audience on Instagram. But the point is they're kind of scratching their heads now because the guy, you know, this has been a great place to get to build an audience. But we're having trouble getting people to donate to us. Right. right. So what you should have done is actually get a lot of those people from Instagram over to their email list. Right. Yeah, because it's it, it does it is a limited availability to access the client directly that way. Yeah. You know, and, you know, social media is to your point, it's awareness. It's just it's replacing maybe billboards, but it's not replacing the direct mail that you used to receive. That's email. Right. And um, yep. and also email is a great tool to push back out to the social media channels and the content right. that you produced elsewhere. But mm -hmm. um, I agree with you that, that it gives your brand a validity that you can't get from just quick pictures or quotes or polls yep. online yep. and things like That's that. That's right. But you know, Aaron and Lucas, one of the things I want to make, um, I really want to stress for your audience, which is really important with whatever they choose, is they need to focus on this. What mm -hmm. I find is most organizations are engaged in too many channels and they really need to bring those down to just one or two channels. Of course, I prefer email, but look, if you want to do blogging, you want to do podcasting, you want to do TikTok or what have you, go all in and be great at it. And don't right. be just okay at five different channels. Right. Yeah. yeah that's that a good point. Sense. And there's also some timing, right? I mean, we, we talked you know, prior to the call here that there's some seasonality to giving, right? With the holidays yes. coming up, that's a big yeah. season. Are, are there other seasons and waves that you see or, and is some of that partner driven and specific or is there really just, yeah. you know, this is the best time? Well, you know, the fall and winter tends to be a really strong time for cause marketing programs, obviously. And, you know, uh, Pinktober obviously is something that is a thing. It's not as big as it used to be. But, you know, what we see is between September and, and December, some of the biggest campaigns of the year. I mean, the Salvation Army campaigns, which are held outside businesses, right? Mm -hmm. And we see campaigns with Make a Mit, Make a Wish. We see thanks and giving programs uh, from St. Jude. So there are a lot of different programs out there. And, um, but it's a great time of year to raise money because people are thinking about that. What I really encourage people to think about is their corporate prospects as much as they think about their individual prospects, right? Because it's a great time to ask people for money. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I, I loved how you were saying, when we were talking beforehand, you were saying the individuals are a lot of the time, the people who are individually contributing to the, to the nonprofit, but make sure you're seeing, well, where do they work? What are they involved yes, in? Because absolutely. their companies are, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Aaron and Lucas, that is so critical. I mean, I always tell people name, address, phone number, email address, and where do you work? Right. Because right. what's great is you already have something, someone that has a connection to that organization. So once you build a strong individual bond with that person, you can go back to that person and say, Hey, Jim, right. I know that you're a senior vice president at Fidelity Investments. You know, they sometimes do sponsor sponsorship. Can you advocate us for, for something like that? So a lot of times what I tell people is good partnerships aren't discovered, they're detected. They're already there some, somewhere in the organization. You just have to be aware of those people and you have to be aware of what to do with them once you start working with them. Right. I love that. And I'm just curious, you know, Lucas did talk about the seasonality and I had sent you a quick question about it, but even over the last five to what, 10 years, Giving Tuesday and the fact that Facebook and Instagram have both, you know, instituted the donate here button. Yep. It, how have you seen that shift the work that you're doing with nonprofits and corporate partners? Um, because I think sometimes now people are, you know, trying to hit the easy button like, oh, OK, well, what we can just do on that Tuesday is just, you know, attached to this cause and just put that donate button there and then we're done, you know. And what are you seeing at that shift in the business for you? Well, you know, it's interesting because when we talk about things like Giving Tuesday, a lot of nonprofits will come to me and say, you know, should we be doing Giving Tuesday? Should we be doing a day like this? And what I often argue is if you already have a lot of 
momentum with your giving programs, it makes a lot of sense to do Giving Tuesday. But if you're just getting going with your giving program and it's taking time, you probably want to opt out at, at Giving Tuesday in terms of asking for money. It's actually a great day to thank people, right? Spend yeah. the whole day thanking people, thanking your donors and stuff like that. But I think it is so critical that we really need to think about because who, you know, what organizations thrive the most on Giving Tuesday? Well-named brands. Mm -hmm. And you know who's really thriving too? Colleges, yeah. colleges, because they have a captive yeah. audience already, right? Of so course. they're using this as kind of the cherry on top of the Sunday. And too often people approach it like, you know, when you look at a Sunday, you just don't want a cherry on top. You want everything else underneath. And a lot right. of organizations have to have that infrastructure, that building under, 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 you know, underneath so that they can have something on top that's meaningful. Yeah, you, you, I agree. It has to be sort of an ongoing effort, too. I, I like the big spikes, you know, ideas you yeah. know, around Giving Tuesday and all of that. But it's sort of like an association, you know, in their events, right? Traditionally, yep. they make all their money around these events or everybody's got this big hoopla right. around the event. But isn't there a way to sort of continue the engagement year long, right? Yeah. It's, it's another nut we can crack. And could there be giving in all year long? Because reality is you just don't know when somebody's going to have a windfall or a heart for something. Yeah. Um, and it, unless you continually sort of remind them and make it part of your, your brand and your mission and your communications, yep. you have a potential to miss a lot of other opportunity. Yeah. And, you know, and associations too uh, ran into the same thing with the pandemic that nonprofits did like, wow, you know, and it's maybe not, it's not always a great idea to focus on events, right? Because when you can't have events anymore, you can't communicate with your audience. And that's why I think it's so important for organizations to go back to their websites, go back to their email list and focus on providing content through digital channels, because we know how important that is. And we know coming out of the pandemic too, hybrid is here to stay, right? We will see events going forward but they are going to be a mix of virtual and live events. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I love it. I, mean, I think that also it's just um, Giving Tuesday, and I, and I think it's good for us to talk about it right now just because it is coming up, and I'm sure there's yeah. plenty of people right now mm -hmm. scrambling, going, you know what, let's just get in on it. It's, yeah. it's almost, to me, a day of, like, it's too much. It's, like, yeah. laid on the guilt trip, yeah. you know, and then I'm looking at 17 different causes my friends all have in my social media feed. And I'm like, I'm not giving $20 to every single one of these. Yeah. So then do I just not give $20 to any of them? Do I just then decide that I'm going to do something? And so, yeah, it's, and it's mostly because people aren't realizing it's because you haven't built any kind of trust or authenticity with me connection yeah. with me to the yeah. thing. I'm just, I'm saying, well, Lucas likes this particular cause. Maybe I'll do it. And if he's the first one in my social feed, maybe he gets my first 20 bucks. And then I just, I'm like, okay, yeah, I can't do the rest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and think about it though. That's why it's so important that nonprofits and associations they engage people throughout the year right. they, people do not just want to get that ask and you know we're seeing nonprofits that are, have created a way of, of doing this here in new england the mark twain house in hartford connecticut wanted to develop a strategy so they could reach people outside the hartford area where the house is located and what they came up with is they came up with a book club so every week I get a newsletter from them now that talks about book club of the guests that they're having on. And now publishers are going to the Mark Twain house and saying, hey, you have this great book club. Can we introduce a new author through this? So one of the things I love about what they do is they are hitting me every week, not with just information about museum hours and what's new in the gift shop, but they're actually talking about like, hey, this author is coming to speak about this topic. You probably would be interested in this. Yeah. So I love that. you know, And I think nonprofits associations need to think outside the boxed in that way too in terms of how they engage their audience because when you're dealing with a niche audience they may be interested in other things that aren't directly related to you hence the book club right you know okay. you can talk about Mark Twain all the time but the truth is is that people uh you know they they should be looking outside that and think love Mark Twain loved books why don't we talk about books because that's something relevant to what we do <laughs> yeah it can't always you know just be approaching you with their handout yes uh, there's got to be some give some relationship and ongoing and yep. then when it comes around, you go, you know what, I've gotten a lot of value out of this. I enjoy their content. I have a relationship here. That's who, you know, I'm going to give my $20 to as Aaron said. That's like, right. That's yeah. right. And Lucas, that's brands commanding, right? In the sense, like someone who is, you know, being relevant in your world, you consider yourself a passionate audience member. And whether you're an association or nonprofit, I think that's so important too. It's like, whatever you do, you have to find the passionate people in your space and get them and really engage because, you know, you can have as few as a few hundred people, a thousand people, and that audience can be really powerful and in, in growing your audience and, and moving it beyond that base. Yeah, there's, there's nothing that turns me off more 
than the organization that hasn't communicated with me all year long and then comes out on Giving Tuesday yeah. and goes, hey, it's time, it's Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they're, like your, they're like your best friend, right? Oh, right. you know, hey, man, you know, look at you, Lucas. You know, I've yeah. lost weight, you know, and, and you know, and, 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 yeah, it doesn't work, right? You know, right. and that's what I always tell people. See, that's the thing is a few weeks before Giving Tuesday, that's when I get all the calls. What's our Giving Tuesday strategy? It's like, that's not the day to plan. Take right. the day after Giving Tuesday to stop planning for next year. That's yeah. how far out you need to be in terms of your planning. Yeah, yeah. Okay. totally agreed. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm always the one who has to come in with a hook at the end of the episode, make sure that we wrap it up because there's so much we could talk to you about. We want to leave something desired for our customers and audiences to listen uh, and contact you. So Joe, we always end our episodes with asking for a referral. Amanda Kiefer is the one who sent us to you. So we're wondering, do you have someone out there that you think that we could continue either this conversation with or other conversations relevant to the association world? Oh, and if I could mention three, that would be great. The first one is uh, David Cassettefield from Engage for Good. He's an expert on cost marketing. He runs a trade association, essentially, for us cost marketers. You should definitely talk to him. We talked about email marketing. You should definitely talk to Joe Polizzi at The Tilt. He's a big fan of email marketing and understand right. how content marketing works. And then we talked about sponsorship, which is something that's really important. Yep. And I would reach out to Larry Wheel, the sponsorship guy in the big state of Texas uh, for more information about that so those are three people for three more episodes for you Aaron. Awesome. I love it that's wow awesome. we've never gotten a three for that's good no, and, and just, raised the bar. Yeah. just <laughs> raised the bar and you get rid of someone in sponsorship in Texas of all places that's, that's awesome right. <laughs> everyone knows that's where that's where all the sponsorship is right, right. Yeah. <laughs> they've got big Perfect. state big hearts yeah so I appreciate it Joe it was really lovely to be able to catch up with you finally and Lucas good to see you as well and um, where can people find you Joe People can find me at my two Keystone content assets, my website, where you can sign up for my email newsletter, and you can also find me on Twitter, at Joe Waters. Okay. And your website's selfishgiving.com, is that right? Yes, selfishgiving.com. Okay. Great. Perfect. Yes. And I love it, because I think I've been there, and I think it, it comes up right away, asking That's about right. the email. Yeah, I love That's it. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You can't really escape the email box wherever you yeah, go. So, I love yeah. it. Yeah. So we'll people go that. there just to even see that it's a great, it's a great Katrin and you've got some clever language in there to get people to sign up. So I appreciate mm -hmm. it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks so much for being with us today. Nice being with you. Thank you, Joe.